Beloved, this is truly a Trinity Sunday unlike any other. So many of us have taken to the streets because of a groundswell of awareness and impatience with the unacceptable. Behooves us now, especially in these times, to pause and consider what it means to be followers of Jesus, what it means to truly be the church of God. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Beloved, our belief in the eternal trinity ought not be a blind, tacit acceptance of some archaic, irrelevant doctrine. For we do not trust and hope in the triune God in vain. As we ponder the mystery at the heart of the divine life, our belief, hope, and trust show us, especially in these times, how needful it is for us to chase after the superabundant life of God that is love, and freedom, that is freeing love, that is loving freedom. The doctrine of the Trinity reveals to us that as God is in the Godhead, so God eternally wills to be in the world. And beloved, the doctrine of the Trinity also reveals what God expects of us because it shows us that what is most essential to the very life of God is relationship, just righteous, gracious, peaceful, life-giving, life-affirming, loving relationship, that this mysterious unity of and between creator, redeemer, and sanctifier is the ground and goal of all creation, indeed that which stirs up and animates in us a capacity for just, righteous, gracious, peaceful, life-giving, life-affirming, loving relationship. We do well to ask, especially now as we mourn the loss of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and countless others. What does this mean for us? Where do we go from here? Beloved, as lovers of this God and followers of this Jesus, it means first and foremost that we must recognize that the law which must be our lodestar is that love which has no condition, exception, or limit, and the order after which we must chase is the gospel of peace as revealed in the life, ministry, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Beloved, as a people called by God, to be a reconciling force for good in the world, it means that our commitment to speak truth to power must be unequivocal. We must vehemently decry racism as that sin which represents the height of human foolishness and folly, as that sin which miscarries the divine truth of our common kinship and summons what is most base and evil in our nature. But not only that, we must boldly declare that the entrenched systemic racism that plagues us is but the tool of a far more insidious primal sin, white supremacy. White supremacy is that stronghold and spiritual wickedness that disenfranchises, maims, and murders that continues to wound, fracture, and estrange us. And beloved, as a woke people empowered by the Holy Spirit to discern the signs of the times, it means also that while we do not condone violence or the destruction of property, and while we lament the fact that so much of this violence and destruction of property occurs in our communities, we see in riots the exponentially compounding effect of centuries of hate and bigotry, apathy and silence, oppression and inequity, disenfranchisement and state-sanctioned lynching. While we rightly respect the maintenance and preservation of property, we ought to care for, love, and respect the dignity, sacred worth, and life of human beings created in the image of God more. So we cry, Black Lives Matter because it is appallingly clear that black lives do not matter. 
How upsetting it is that in this day and age, we still have to convince other human beings that we are human beings too. And once again, we observe yet another time of lament. We mourn Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and countless others, and rightly ask, where do we go from here? This past Wednesday evening, I was impelled to join the protest at Centennial Olympic Park. Words fail to fitly describe how dramatic was the scene of National Guardsmen, state troopers, and police officers at attention, blocking off certain streets, or how emotionally charged was the atmosphere. Yet what remains with me more than any of that was a sign that I saw there that read, because George Floyd could not breathe, we cannot rest, and it's true. Beloved, because George Floyd could not breathe, we cannot rest, we shall not rest, for our commitment and resolve will be aided by our white brothers and sisters, indeed by all our brothers and sisters, who commit to the slow, painful, difficult work of awakening, dismantling systemic and institutional white supremacy and racism and disrupting white privilege. Because George Floyd could not breathe, we cannot rest, we shall not rest, for we know full well that, quite frankly, some of our white brothers and sisters will never give a damn that some will always undermine our flourishing and seek to injure, even kill us. Because George Floyd could not breathe, we cannot rest. We shall not rest. We shall summon the courage of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and rise to face and meet the spiritual and existential threat posed by white supremacy and racism. We shall persevere. And yes, we shall fight. But as blessed Paul reminds us, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Yes, we shall fight. We shall fight with the weapons of the angels. Faith, hope, and love. We shall fight with the weapons of the angels and not carnal weapons of destruction. Not because systemic racism demands that we compartmentalize our anger and our fear, that we work twice as hard, that we be better. No, beloved, we shall fight with the weapons of the angels. We will be, we must be better because we are followers of Jesus. Armed with faith in the living God, we shall give of our time, talent, and treasure to the level of our righteous expectation, so to ensure that the names of our fallen are never forgotten, that their stories are told, our commitment to telling their stories, to decrying the evil that cut their lives and the lives of so many others short, to demanding righteous change is the breeding ground for an awakening that will engender true healing. Armed with hope in the power of the resurrection, we shall beat the streets, Crowd the halls of justice and the halls of government, shouting, Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace, say their names. Trusting as more voices join the throng that the harmony of this angelic chorus will undermine and topple white supremacist structures and overpower the din of racism's evil in human cacophony. This hope has to be the foundation upon which, by the grace of God, we renew our sincere interest in a common humanity whose heart beats as one. And armed with the love of Jesus, we shall look into the eyes of all those whom we encounter and mean it when we say, what happens to you makes a difference to me. What happens to you makes a difference to me. In this spirit, armed with and thus apprehended by faith, hope, and love. The same God who was with Moses at the Red Sea. The same God who was with Joshua at Jericho. The same God who rained down fire on Mount Carmel. The same God who joined Shadrach, 
Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. The same God who tabernacled the divine and human flesh. The same God who fellowshiped with us as human being to human being. The same God who vanquished death on the hardwood of the cross. The same God who raised Jesus by the spirit of holiness. This God shall be with us because we have testified and witnessed by our faith, hope, and love that we are with God. And so we shall, we must fervently pray that we might use this groundswell of awareness and impatience with the unacceptable to make of this old world a new world. And in this spirit, in this power, impelled by the spirit of God that indwells each and every one of us, we shall, yes, we shall, we shall overcome. So let it be.